Chapter 2 I heard that the British Council were recruiting staff, so in early August I went along to Davies Street and was interviewed by an eager lady with a culture-stricken mind and a Rhodian voice and vocabulary. It was frightfully impotent, she told me, as if in confidence, that we were represented abroad by the right type. But it was an awful bore. All the posts had to be advertised and the candidates chosen by interview. And anyway, they were having to cut down on overseas personnel, actually. She came to the point. The only jobs available meant teaching English in foreign schools. Or did that sound too ghastly? I said it did. In the last week of August, half as a joke, I advertised the traditional insertion. I had a number of replies to my curt offer to go anywhere and do anything. Apart from the pamphlets reminding me that I was God's, there were three charming letters from funless and alert swindlers, and there was one that mentioned unusual and remunerative work in Tangiers. Could I speak Italian? But my answer went unanswered. September loomed. I began to feel desperate. I saw myself cornered, driven back in despair to the dreaded educational supplement, and those endless pale gray lists of endless pale gray jobs. So one morning I returned to Davies Street. I asked if they had any teaching jobs in the Mediterranean area, and the woman with the frightful intensifiers went off to fetch a file. I sat under a puce and tomato Matthew Smith in the waiting room and began to see myself in Madrid, in Rome, or Marseille, or Barcelona, even Lisbon. It would be different abroad. There would be no common room, and I should write poetry. She returned. All the good things had gone, she was terribly afraid. But there were these. She handed me a sheet about a school in Milan. I shook my head. She approved. We actually, well, actually then there's only this. We've just advertised it. She handed me a clipping. The Lord Byron School, Fraxos. The Lord Byron School, Fraxos, Greece, requires in early October an assistant master to teach English. Candidates must be single and must have a degree in English. A knowledge of modern Greek is not essential. The salary is worth about 600 pounds per annum and is fully convertible. Two-year contract renewable, fares paid at the beginning and end of contract. There was an information sheet that long-windedly amplified the advertisement. Phroxos was an island in the Aegean about 80 miles from Athens. The Lord Byron was one of the most famous boarding schools in Greece, run on English public school lines, whence the name. It appeared to have every facility a school should have. One had to give a maximum of five lessons a day. The schools were terribly well spoken of, and the islands simply heavenly. You've been there? She was about thirty, a born spinster with a lack of sexuality so total that her smart clothes and too heavy makeup made her pathetic, like an unsuccessful geisha. She hadn't been there, but everybody said so. I reread the advertisement. Why have they left it so late? Well, we understand they did appoint another man, not through us, but there's been some awful mess up. I looked again at the information sheet. We haven't actually recruited for them before. We're only doing it out of courtesy now, as a matter of fact. She gave me a patient smile. Her front teeth were much too big. I asked in my best Oxford voice if I might take her out to lunch. When I got home, I filled in the form she had brought to the restaurant and went straight out and posted it. That same evening, by a curious neatness of fate, I met Allison. Chapter 3 I suppose I'd had, by the standards of that pre-permissive time, a good deal of sex for my age. Girls, or a certain kind of girl, liked me. I had a car, not so common among undergraduates in those days, and I had some money. I wasn't ugly, and even more important, I had my loneliness, 
which, as every cat knows, is a deadly weapon with women. My technique was to make a show of unpredictability, cynicism, and indifference. Then, like a conjurer with his white rabbit, I produced the solitary heart. I didn't collect conquests, but by the time I left Oxford, I was a dozen girls away from virginity. I found my sexual success and the apparently ephemeral nature of love equally pleasing. It was like being good at golf, but despising the game. One was covered all round, both when one played and when one didn't. I contrived most of my affairs in the vacations away from Oxford, since the new term meant that I could conveniently leave the scene of the crime. There were sometimes a few tedious weeks of letters, but I soon put the solitary heart away, assumed responsibility with my total being, and showed the Chesterfieldian mask instead. I became almost as neat at ending liaisons as at starting them. This sounds and was calculating, but it was caused less by a true coldness than by my narcissistic belief in the importance of the lifestyle. I mistook the feeling of relief that dropping a girl always brought for a love of freedom. Perhaps the one thing in my favor was that I lied very little. I was always careful to make sure that the current victim knew, before she took her clothes off, the difference between coupling and marrying. But then, in East Anglia, things became complicated. I started to take the daughter of one of the older masters out. She was pretty in a stock English way, as province hating as myself, and she seemed rather passionate but I belatedly realized she was passionate for a purpose. I was to marry her. I began to be sick of the way a mere bodily need threatened to distort my life. There were even one or two evenings when I felt myself near surrendering to Janet, a fundamentally silly girl I knew I didn't love and would never love. Our parting scene, an infinitely sour all night of nagging and weeping in the car beside the July sea, haunted me. Fortunately, I knew, and she knew I knew, that she was not pregnant. I came to London with the firm determination to stay away from women for a while. The Russell Square flat below the one I had rented had been empty through most of August. But then one Sunday I heard movements, doors slammed, and there was music. I passed a couple of uninteresting-looking girls on the stairs on the Monday, heard them talking, all their short A's flattened into short E's as I went on down. They were Australians. Then came the evening of the day I had lunch with Miss Spencer Hay, a Friday. About six, there was a knock on the door, and the stockier of the two girls I had seen was standing there. "'Oh, hi, I'm Margaret, from below.' I took her outstretched hand. "'Glad to know you. Look, we're having ourselves a bottle party. Like to come along?' "'Oh, well, actually, it'll be noisy up here.' It was the usual thing, an invitation to kill complaint. I hesitated, then shrugged. All right, thanks. Well, that's good. Eight? She began to go downstairs, but she called back. You have a girlfriend you'd like to bring? Not just now. We'll fix you up. Hi. And she was gone. I wish then that I hadn't accepted. So I went down when I could hear that a lot of people had already arrived. The ugly girls, they always arrived first, would, I hoped, have been disposed of. The door was opened. I went in through a little hall and stood in the doorway of the living room, holding my bottle of Algerian burgundy, ready to present. I tried to discover in the crowded room one of the two girls I had seen before. Loud Australian voices, a man in a kilt, and several West Indians. It didn't look my sort of party and I was within five seconds of slipping back out. Then someone arrived and stood in the hall behind me. It was a girl of about my own age carrying a heavy suitcase with a small rucksack on her shoulders. 
She was wearing a whitish Macintosh, creased and travel-weary, and she had the sort of tan that only weeks in hot sun could give. Her long hair was not quite blonde, but bleached almost to that color. It looked odd, because the urchin cut was the fashion. Girls like boys, not girls like girls. And there was something German, Danish, about her, waif-like, yet perversely or immorally so. She kept back from the open doorway, beckoned me. Her smile was very thin, very insincere, and very curt. Could you find Maggie and ask her to come out? Margaret? She nodded. I forced my way through the packed room and eventually caught sight of Margaret in the kitchen. Hi there. You made it. Someone wants to see you outside, a girl with a suitcase. Oh, no. She turned to a woman behind her. I sensed trouble. She hesitated, then put down the quart beer bottle she was opening. I followed her plump shoulders back through the crowd. Allison, you said next week. I spent all my money. The waif gave the older girl an oddly split look, half guilty and half wary. Is Pete back? No. The voice dropped, half warning. But Charlie and Bill are. Oh, Mert. She looked outraged. I must have a bath. Charlie spilled it to cool the beer. It stuck to the brim. The girl with the tan sagged. I broke in. Use mine. Upstairs. Yes? Allison, this is... Nicholas. Would you mind? I've just come from Paris. I noticed she had two voices, one almost Australian, one almost English. Of course, I'll take you up. I must go and get some gear first. As soon as she went into the room, there was a shout. Hey, Allie, where you been, girl? Two or three of the Australian men gathered round her. She kissed them all briefly. In a minute, Margaret, one of those fat girls who mother thin girls, pushed them away. Allison reappeared with the clothes she wanted, and we went up. Oh, Jesus, she said, Australians. Where have you been? All over, France, Spain. We went into the flat. I'll just clean the spiders out of the bath. Have a drink, over there. When I came back, she was standing with a glass of scotch in her hand. She smiled again, but it was an effort, shut off almost at once. I helped her remove her Macintosh. She was wearing a French perfume so dark, it was almost carbolic, and her primrose shirt was dirty. You live downstairs? Uh-huh. Share. She raised her glass in silent toast. She had candid gray eyes, the only innocent things in a corrupt face, as if circumstances, not nature, had forced her to be hard, to fend for herself, yet to seem to need defending, and her voice, only very slightly Australian, yet not English, veered between harshness, faint nasal rancidity, and a strange, salty directness. She was bizarre, a kind of human oxymoron. Are you alone at the party? Yes. Would you keep with me this evening? Of course. Come back in about twenty minutes? I'll wait. I'd rather you came back. We exchanged weary smiles. I went back to the party. Margaret came up. I think she'd been waiting. I'm a nice English girl, anxious to meet you, Nicholas. I'm afraid your friends jumped to the gun. She stared at me, then round, then motioned me back into the hall. Listen, this is a little difficult to explain. But Allison, she's engaged to my brother. Some of his friends are here tonight. So? She's been very mixed up. I still don't understand. Just that I don't want a rough house. We had one once before. I looked blank. People grow jealous on others' behalf? I shan't start anything. Someone called her from inside. She tried to feel sure of me, but failed and apparently decided she couldn't do anything about it. Fair deal, but you have the message. Absolutely. She gave me a veteran's look, then a nod not a very happy one, and went away. 
I waited for about twenty minutes near the door, and then I slipped out and went back up to my own flat. I rang the bell. There was a long pause, then there was a voice behind the door. Who is it? Twenty minutes. The door opened. She had her hair up and a towel wrapped round her. Very brown shoulders, very brown legs. She went quickly back into the bathroom. Draining water gurgled. I shouted through the door. I've been warned off you. Maggie? She says she doesn't want a rough house. Fucking cow, she's my potential sister-in-law. I know. Studying sociology, London University. There was a pause. Isn't it crazy? You go away and you think people will have changed, and they're just the same. What does that mean? Wait a minute. I waited several, but then the door opened, and she came out into the living room. She was wearing a very simple white dress, and her hair was down again. She had no makeup and looked ten times prettier. She gave me a little bitten-in grin. I pass? The bell of the ball. Her look was so direct I found it disconcerting. We go down? Just one finger? I filled her glass again and with more than one finger. Watching the whiskey fall, she said, I don't know why I'm frightened. Why am I frightened? What of? I don't know. Maggie, the boys, the dear old diggers, this rough house. Oh, God, it was so stupid. There was a nice Israeli boy. We were just kissing. It was a party, that was all, but Charlie told Pete, and they just picked a quarrel, and, oh, God, you know, he-men. Downstairs, I lost her for a time. A group formed around her. I went and got a drink and passed it over someone's shoulders. Talk about Cannes, about Collioure and Valencia. Jazz had started in the back room, and I went to the doorway to watch. Outside the window, past the dark dancers, were dusk trees, a pale amber sky. I had a sharp sense of alienation from everyone around me. A girl with spectacles, myopic eyes, and an insipidly soft face, one of those soulful intellectual creatures born to be preyed on and exploited by phonies, smiled coyly from the other side of the room. She was standing alone, and I guessed that she was the nice English girl Margaret had picked for me. Her lipstick was too red, and she was as familiar as a species of bird. I turned away from her, as from a cliff edge, and went and sat on the floor by a bookshelf. There I pretended to read a paperback. Allison knelt beside me. I'm sloshed. That whiskey. Hey, have some of this. It was gin. She sat sideways. I shook my head. I thought of that white-faced English girl with the red smudged mouth. At least this girl was alive. Crude, but alive. I'm glad you returned tonight. She sipped her gin and gave me a small, sizing look. I tried again. Ever read this? Let's cut corners. To hell with literature. You're clever, and I'm beautiful. Now let's talk about who we really are. The gray eyes teased, or dared. Pete? He's a pilot, she mentioned a famous airline. We shack together, off and on, that's all. Ah. He's doing a conversion course in the States. She stared at the floor for a moment, a different girl, more serious. Engaged as Maggie talk, we're not like that. She half flicked a glance at me. Free people. It wasn't clear whether she was talking about her fiancé or for my benefit, or whether freedom was her pose or her truth. What do you do? Things. Reception, mostly. Hotels. Anything. She wrinkled her nose. I have applied for a new job, air hostess. That's why I went off polishing French and Spanish these last weeks. Can I take you out tomorrow? A heavy Australian in his thirties came and leant against the door jamb opposite. Oh, Charlie, she cried across the room. He's just lent me his bath. It's nothing. Charlie nodded his head slowly, then pointed an admonitory stubby finger. He pushed himself vertical and went unsteadily away. 
Charming. She turned over her hand and looked at the palm. Did you spend two and a half years in a Jap prisoner of war camp? No. Why? Charlie did. Poor Charlie. There was a silence. Australians are boors and Englishmen are prigs. I make fun of him because he's in love with me and he likes it. But no one else makes fun of him, if I'm around. There was another silence. Sorry. That's okay. About tomorrow? No, about you. Gradually, though I was offended at having been taught a lesson in the art of not condescending, she made me talk about myself. She did it by asking blunt questions and by brushing aside empty answers. I began to talk about being a brigadier's son, about loneliness, and for once, mostly not to glamorize myself, but simply to explain. I discovered two things about Allison, that behind her bluntness she was an expert coaxer, a handler of men, a sexual diplomat, and that her attraction lay as much in her candor as in her having a pretty body, an interesting face, and knowing it. She had a very un-English ability to flash out some truth, some seriousness, some quick surge of interest. I fell silent. I knew she was watching me. After a moment, I looked at her. She had a shy, thoughtful expression, a new self. Allison, I like you. I think I like you. You've got quite a nice mouth for a prig. You're the first Australian girl I've ever met. Poor Pom. All the lights except one dim one had long ago been put out, and there were the usual surrendered couples on all available furniture and floor space. The party had paired off. Maggie seemed to have disappeared, and Charlie lay fast asleep on the bedroom floor. We danced. We began close and became closer. I kissed her hair and then her neck, and she pressed my hand and moved a little closer still. Shall we go upstairs? You go first. I'll come in a minute. She slipped away, and I went up to my flat. Ten minutes passed, and then she was in the doorway, a faintly apprehensive smile on her face. She stood there in her white dress, small, innocent, corrupt, coarse, fine, an expert novice. She came in, I shut the door, and we were kissing at once. For a minute, two minutes, pressed back against the door in the darkness, there were steps outside, and a sharp double rap. Allison put her hand over my mouth. Another double rap, and then another. Hesitation, heartbeats, the footsteps went away. Come on, she said. Come on, come on.